In January 2024, two Navy SEALs disappeared in rough seas off the coast of Somalia. They were part of a nighttime raid launched from a ship most Americans have never heard of, a floating fortress that looks like an ordinary oil tanker, but hides capabilities that have Pentagon strategists calling it the future of naval warfare. The target? A Dow carrying Iranian ballistic missile components bound for Houthi rebels in Yemen, the kind of weapons that had been terrorizing Red Sea shipping for months. The result? The first major weapon seizure since the Houthis began their assault on global commerce. Cruise missile warheads, guidance systems, propulsion units, all intercepted before they could sink another cargo ship. But here's what makes this story really interesting. The ship that made it all possible wasn't a billion dollar destroyer or a nuclear powered carrier. It was in 785 foot converted oil tanker that cost about half a billion dollars, roughly a quarter the price of traditional amphibious ships. Welcome to the world of the Expeditionary Sea Base, a vessel so cleverly designed that adversaries can barely distinguish it from civilian shipping. A platform so versatile, it can launch special operations raids one day and coordinate humanitarian relief the next. The Navy has six of them now, and by the time you finish this video, you'll understand why they might be the most important ships America isn't talking about and why China is taking notes. So what exactly makes an oil tanker into a warship? The answer reveals something fascinating about how modern naval power actually works. Because the Expeditionary Sea Base program started with a problem that traditional warships couldn't solve. Picture this. It's the early 2000s. The US Navy needs to conduct mine countermeasures in the Persian Gulf, deploy special operations forces globally, provide aviation support in low-intensity conflict zones, and do all of this without tying up expensive amphibious assault ships that are needed elsewhere. Traditional solution? Build more billion-dollar amphibious ships, wait 10 years, spend astronomical amounts on maintenance. The Navy's actual solution? Buy commercial oil tankers and convert them. Wait, it gets better. These aren't just any tankers. They're based on the Alaska-class crude oil carrier design, each one displacing 90,000 tons as long as two and a half football fields with a 52,000 square foot flight deck that's the third largest in the entire Navy. But here's the mystery that had naval analysts scratching their heads. How do you take a ship designed to haul petroleum across oceans and turn it into a platform capable of supporting the most dangerous missions in military operations? The answer involves some genuinely clever engineering and some strategic thinking that's changing how America projects power. Because these ships operate in a tactical gray zone they're operated by civilian mariners from the military sea lift commands until they're not. They sail under the USNS designation, United States Naval Ship, until the mission requires them to become USS, United States Ship, full warships with military crews. Think about that for a second. A ship that can transform its legal status depending on mission requirements. That can blend into commercial shipping lanes virtually undetected. That costs a fraction of purpose-built warships but delivers capabilities those expensive platforms can't match in certain scenarios. The Lewis B. Puller, the lead ship in the ESB class, replaced the USS Ponce in the Persian Gulf in 2017. It was the first U.S. warship ever commissioned outside American territory. Happened in Bahrain. Why Bahrain? Why that particular moment? And what has happened since that's made these ships absolutely indispensable? Keep this in mind. By mid-2024, these vessels had participated in operations that literally changed the calculus of Middle Eastern power projection. To understand why these ships matter, you need to know what the Navy faced before they existed. For decades, forward presence meant one thing. Expensive capital ships on extended deployments, aircraft carriers, amphibious ready groups, guided missile destroyers, each costing billions, each requiring massive support infrastructure and each one screaming American military to anyone with a radar or satellite feed. The problem with that? Not every mission needs or benefits from that kind of visibility. Sometimes you need persistence in a region without escalation, aviation support without deploying a carrier strike group, a floating base for operations that don't warrant the political implications of putting boots on foreign soil. The ESB concept traces back to the mobile landing platform program. The Navy initially built two expeditionary transfer docks, the Montford Point and John Glenn, designed to transfer equipment from large ships to smaller landing craft. Float on, float off capability for hovercrafts in the middle of the ocean. But somebody at the Pentagon had a better idea. What if we took that same commercial hull design and reconfigured it? 
not for equipment transfer, but as a genuine forward operating base, a ship that could host mine clearing helicopters, accommodate 250 special operations personnel, store weapons and fuel, provide command and control for complex maritime operations. The result was the Lewis B. Puller class expeditionary sea base, purpose-built variants of the same Alaska class tanker design. Now here's what they didn't advertise. These ships fundamentally changed the economics of naval presence. Traditional amphibious ships, LPDs and LHDs, cost upwards of $2 billion each, require military-grade everything, need constant modernization to stay combat relevant. ESBs, around $540 million per ship, built to commercial standards where possible, much lower operating costs, and because they're based on a proven tanker design, incredibly reliable. Mark Kansian, retired Marine Corps colonel and analyst at CSIS, told Naval News in 2024 that ESBs provide useful and highly demanded capabilities at a cost far below traditional amphibs. Translation, you get about 70% of the capability for about 25% of the cost. But here's what they missed initially. These ships would prove their worth in scenarios nobody fully anticipated, because between 2023 and 2025, the Middle East became exactly the kind of operational environment where ESBs shine, and the Lewis B. Puller found itself at the center of it. January 11, 2024. Arabian Sea, High Seas, Darkness. The USS Lewis B. Puller detected a suspicious Dow off the coast of Somalia. Intelligence suggested weapon smuggling, Iranian components destined for Yemen. This is where the ESB's design philosophy pays off. SEALs deployed from the ship's mission deck in small combat craft, backed by helicopters from the massive flight deck above, supported by drones providing overwatch. The entire operation coordinated from onboard command facilities. The boarding happened around 8 p.m. local time. Rough seas, high waves, one SEAL got knocked overboard. His teammate went after him. Both disappeared into the darkness. Despite exhaustive search efforts, neither was recovered. A tragic reminder that even routine operations carry extraordinary risk. But what the team found aboard that Dow changed the tactical picture in the Red Sea. Propulsion systems for medium-range ballistic missiles, guidance packages, warheads, air defense components, anti-ship cruise missile parts, the exact weapons the Houthis had been using to attack commercial shipping and threaten U.S. Navy vessels. This was the first major interdiction of Iranian weapons to the Houthis since they begun their Red Sea campaign in November 2023, the first seizure of advanced Iranian missile components by the Navy since 2019. Now here's where it gets interesting. The Lewis B. Puller wasn't operating alone. It was part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, the U.S.-led coalition protecting Red Sea shipping. But while destroyers and cruisers provided air defense and strike capabilities, the ESB provided something different. Persistent presence without the astronomical operating costs. An Arleigh Burke-class destroyer burns through fuel at a much higher rate. An ESB, diesel electric propulsion, commercial efficiency, can loiter on station for extended periods without breaking the budget. By March 2024, U.S. and coalition forces had destroyed over 150 Houthi missiles and launchers, struck storage facilities, hit command and control nodes. But the most effective operations weren't the airstrikes, they were the interdictions, the boarding operations, the intelligence collection missions that prevented weapons from ever reaching their targets. And those missions relied on platforms like the Lewis B. Puller. Wait, it gets better. The modular nature of ESB design means these ships adapt to mission requirements. Need mine countermeasures? Embark MH-53 EC Dragon helicopters with their towed sonar arrays. Need special operations support? Configure the mission deck for small boat operations and install accommodation modules. The flight deck handles four helicopters simultaneously. Can support CH-53 heavy lift birds, MH-60 Seahawks, MV-22 Osprey tilt rotors, even Army AH-64 Apaches have done deck landing qualifications on these ships. In October 2024, the Lewis B. Puller participated in Warrior Voyage 2024, a comprehensive evaluation of ESB capabilities by Marine Aviation Logistics Squadron 24. The Marines tested everything from high-tempo flight operations to aviation maintenance in contested environments. Verdict? These ships work. But remember, there are now six ESBs either operational or under construction. Lewis B. Puller in the 5th Fleet area, Herschel Woody Williams rotationally deployed to Africa, Miguel Keith in the Pacific, John L. Canley commissioned in February 2024, 
Robert E. Simonic delivered September 2024. Hector A. Cafferata Jr. under construction at General Dynamics National Steel and Shipbuilding Company in San Diego. Each one represents a force multiplier, a platform that can operate independently or as part of larger task forces, forward deployed presence without the political implications of permanent bases. And here's the kicker, adversaries struggle to target them effectively. In January 2024, Houthi officials claimed they launched a missile attack on the Lewis B. Puller. Pentagon officials couldn't confirm any such incident. The Houthis have made false claims before, including a fabricated attack on a U.S. flag vessel that never happened. Why the confusion? Because these ships operate among commercial traffic. They look like tankers. They move like tankers until they launch special operations raids or coordinate helicopter assaults. That ambiguity? That's a feature, not a bug. So what does all this mean for American naval strategy? First, the era of exclusively high-end platforms for every mission is over. The Navy learned something critical. You don't need a $2 billion amphibious ship for every deployment. Sometimes an ESB delivering 70% of the capability at 25% of the cost is the smarter play. Second, these ships solve the presence problem. China builds islands in the South China Sea to project power without deploying capital ships. Until the collapse of the Assad regime in December 2024, Russia maintained facilities in Syria for Mediterranean access, but convinced Sudan in February 2025 to establish a naval logistics base in Port Sudan, granting it its first military foothold on the African continent. Iran uses proxy forces and forward bases throughout the Middle East. America now has mobile bases that don't require host nation permissions that can persist in contested regions without the escalatory signal of a carrier strike group that blend into commercial shipping until they're needed. Mark Canson called them perfect for medium to low threat environments, exactly where most actual naval operations happen. Not every mission needs an Aegis destroyer. Sometimes you need sustained presence, helicopter support, and the ability to launch small boat operations. Third, the Red Sea operations proved the concept under fire. When Houthi rebels began attacking commercial shipping in late 2023, the international response required a mix of capabilities. High-end destroyers for air defense, submarines for strike missions, and ESBs for interdiction operations and persistent presence. The Lewis B. Puller's January 2024 weapon seizure demonstrated tactical flexibility. The ship supported Navy SEALs conducting complex boarding operations in international waters, provided command and control for the mission, processed seized materials, all while maintaining station in a hostile maritime environment. Fourth, the future is modular. General Dynamics National Steel and Shipbuilding Company, the builder, has proposed upgrades that would turn these ships into drone motherships, launch and recovery systems for large unmanned underwater vehicles, dedicated aft flight deck for UAV operations, enhanced command and control for coordinating unmanned systems. The ESB already has nearly 40 seats for operational planners, the third largest flight deck in the Navy, massive mission deck space, perfect platform for the next generation warfare. And here's something adversaries are watching closely. These ships represent asymmetric innovation, taking commercial designs and militarizing them just enough, getting 70 to 80% capability for a fraction of the cost, building depth in the fleet without breaking the shipbuilding budget. That's a formula others might copy. So where does this go next? The Navy currently has six ESBs, some analysts argue they need 30, not to replace amphibious ships entirely, but to complement them, to provide the intermediate lift capability for distributed maritime operations in the Pacific. Because here's the strategic reality. Great power competition with China requires persistent presence across an enormous operational area. Traditional capital ships alone can't provide that presence economically. ESBs operating as mobile staging bases? That changes the calculus. Position them at strategic locations use them to support smaller unmanned vessels and landing ships operating inside contested zones, provide helicopter support and command facilities without requiring access to foreign ports. The Pacific Theater demands exactly this kind of flexibility. General Dynamics is actively pitching modifications, UUV launch systems for undersea warfare, enhanced UAV facilities for persistent surveillance, more sophisticated C2 architecture for controlling distributed forces. These aren't science fiction proposals. They're logical extensions of a proven platform. But there's a bigger question. How many can America actually build? NASCO has the yard capacity. 
The commercial design means construction is relatively straightforward and the demand signal from fleet commanders is strong. The limiting factor isn't engineering, it's budget and shipbuilding priorities. Virginia-class submarines, Columbia-class ballistic missile boats, Constellation-class frigates, CVN-80 and CVN-81 aircraft carriers, all competing for limited resources. Yet ESBs deliver asymmetric value. Remember that SEAL raid in January 2024? That weapons interdiction? Those aren't missions you accomplish with submarines or frigates. You need forward-deployed, persistent, adaptable platforms designed for exactly this kind of operation. So here's the bottom line. The expeditionary sea base represents something rare in modern defense procurement, a genuinely innovative solution to real operational problems. Commercial design keeping costs manageable. Modular mission packages providing flexibility. Legal ambiguity creating tactical options. These aren't the ships that make headlines. They're the ships that make the mission possible. And that, ultimately, is what great naval strategy looks like. Not just platforms that can fight and win, but platforms that can prevent fights from happening at all. Subscribe if you want more stories about the weapon systems actually shaping modern warfare. Not the flashiest, the smartest.